The Netherlands became famous in the 1420s when the information spread about the new method of oil painting with use of the newly developed oil and egg emulsion, which allowed a particularly shiny and transparent quality to be attained. In fact, the oil paintings were impressive in their miraculously luminous color layers, giving an almost jeweled effect, and the spectacular illusion attained in the treatment of actual reality. These qualities are also characteristic of a small diptych with two scenes, the Trinity and the Virgin and Child at Fireside, painted by Robert Campen, who invited the viewer to contemplate the initial and the last phases of Christ's life on earth. If the composition of the Trinity directly depends on traditional medieval formulae of the canonical representation of the crucifixion, the handling of the other part is more free in the compositional structure as well as in its emotional treatment. Robert Campen followed the tradition of Jan van Eyck, who ranks as the founder of the Dutch school of painting with his brother Hubert. Jan van Eyck discovered, and his successors widely affirmed, that the illusion of reality could be heightened by a systematic arrangement of light and shade which subdued the color of the object and created atmosphere. In affirming true faithfulness, all objects in this painting, and in Dutch painting as a whole, are endowed with symbolic meaning. A washing set and a towel as the signs of Mary's purity, clean window glass as the sign of pellucidity for divine light, etc. The aura of inner peace, domestic comfort and calmness of a human soul is dominant in the emotional treatment of this scene. Robert Campen didn't display much desire to build up the precise linear perspective. He handled this task empirically. His major aim was more in the harmonious veneration of this world as a creation of God than in the purely scientific investigation of its inner laws. The painters considered St. Luke, one of the Gospel writers, as their direct patron, for according to the medieval legend, he created the first pictorial image of Mary as he saw her in his vision. It was often the case that some painter made a self-portrait when representing the image of St. Luke. It was also supposed that in the Hermitage painting, St. Luke portrays the Virgin by the Dutch painter Rogier van der Weyden we can see the master himself. The viewer's eye and the painter's art are concentrated on precisely observed details, such as the charming, childish movements of the limbs of the child and the specific gesture of holding the silver point with the thumb and forefinger and dropping a perpendicular on the drawing surface. The space is devoted to the placid and calm interior and the equally harmonious distant view to which our gaze is drawn by two figures, male and female, standing near the parapet with their backs to us. It cannot be excluded that the painter represented a real townscape, either that of Tournai, where he studied in 1427-1432 in the workshop of Robert Campen, or a view of Brussels, where he later became the city painter. This figure, with hands folded in prayer, is not shrunken to himself like the first one, but seems to appeal to the heavens. The broken folds of its cloak, with its complicated diagonals and ovals, suggest a feeling of deep inner agitation.
The artists considered St. Luke, one of the Gospel writers, as their direct patron, for, according to the medieval legend, he created the first pictorial image of Mary as he saw her in his vision. The history of this picture, several versions of which are known in museums of Boston, Munich, and Bruges, is quite unusual. It was brought to Spain where it was divided into two parts, which later found themselves with different owners. It was good luck that each part was bought for the Hermitage at different times to be reunited in this collection. The treatment the master chose for the holy assemblage, shrunk into sorrow, distinguishes itself through particular discretion and a wish to avoid exaggerated gestures and overwrought facial expression. Intense dramatic force is created here by the tension of red, blue, white, and green splashes of color. It would be difficult to imagine a grief more concise and emphatic than that embodied in the acute forms of this statue. The heavy vertical folds of the long cloak affirm a majestic rhythm characteristic of an unhurried funeral procession. The face, contorted with grief, is barely seen under the cloak's hood. This figure was a part of a sculptural group which Such small altarpieces, composed of two leaves which closed like a book, became widespread during the 15th century, especially in the Netherlands. One scene of this diptych, Christ as a child, reveals the Christian dogma of incarnation. The other one, the Trinity, is devoted to the dogma of redemption. In compliance with this dogma, the dead Christ is surmounted by images of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. While the idea of sacrifice dominates in the panel with the scene of the Trinity, the right panel calls to mind the image of the peaceful childhood of Christ when he was surrounded by the warm care of his mother. In the first half of the 16th century, new themes and genres appeared in Dutch art. The Dutch painter, Lucas van Leyden, also had a great reputation as a master of copper engraving. Almost nothing is known about the Leyden school of the early 16th century, but at a very early age, Lucas proved to be capable of creating supremely competent line engravings, such as his Dairy Maid of 1510 which displays sensitive, brilliant draftsmanship and an inventiveness in subject which was common in the North. Here he was the first to turn to peasant imagery, which foreshadowed the same interest in the peasant theme 
by Pieter Brugel the Elder. Lucas van Leyden demonstrated his ability to endow acutely observed scenes of actual reality with true monumentalism, thanks to the well-balanced composition. In another print from Lucas's hand, we can see Mary Magdalene, seemingly before the events described in the Gospels, treated as a smartly dressed peasant woman at a village feast. The composition includes many details and interesting motifs of everyday life in Holland. In his woodcuts and engravings, as well as in his altarpieces, Lucas loved to represent crowded scenes where the chief personages are seen amidst human masses. This treatment is characteristic of his last and best work in oil technique, the altar triptych with the central scene, Healing of the Blind Man from Jericho. Christ and the blind man are surrounded by a mixed crowd dressed in the costumes of that time, animatedly discussing the goings-on and demonstrating various different attitudes toward the major personage. The gospel event is handled here as a genre scene. The figures of heralds on the side panels, used to represent the commissioner's arms, contribute the element of an attractive theater performance to this altar painting. It is, in fact, more a colorful and diverting pageant than an object of pious veneration. Humanist ideas found wide resonance in the culture of the Netherlands during the 16th century. In the painting The Holy Family, by Hus van Cleef, for example, there is an interesting detail to it the face of Saint Joseph, which bears a similarity to the great European humanist Erasmus of Rotterdam. Italian culture and the art of the Italian Renaissance inspired many painters in Northern Europe. Jan van Hemesen, in his painting The Penitent Saint Jerome, representing in the foreground the large nude figure, was influenced by the art of Michelangelo. Lambert Lombard was well acquainted with Italian humanism, for he traveled to Italy and had profound knowledge of contemporary and ancient culture. But in his self-portrait, he was not inclined to ennoble his appearance in compliance with classical models. Lambert followed native Dutch traditions when he aimed at truth in art with the most detailed faithfulness of all observed things. As in all Dutch landscapes of that time, the world is represented here in its immensity and infinite diversity of nature. Among the mountains, plains, groves, and villages, the gospel episode also finds its place. We can see the Holy Family making their way into Egypt under the protection of God the Father. The flowers of Aquilegia under the child's feet serve as a traditional symbol of Christ, while the carnation in Mary's hand evokes a parallel with a future sacrificial death of Christ. There are many details in this picture that have hidden meaning. The sectioned orange, for example, signifies the lost entirety of the world because of people's sins. The 
painting includes many characters and motifs that evoke a parallel with works by Peter Bruegel the Elder. The group of invalids in the foreground, dressed in carnival hats and costumes with foxtails, recall the figures in the famous picture by Bruegel in the Louvre. The painter demonstrated considerable keenness of observation in the representation of peasants, which was a new theme in the art of the period. While balancing the composition very carefully, Lucas von Leyden bestowed this simple scene with real monumentality. The motifs of Lucas's engravings are sometimes very rare. An example is this sheet, with a depiction of Magdalene's life before her meeting Christ. As usual, the composition built up by Lucas von Leyden includes many interesting details describing the pleasures of life. Christ and the blind man are surrounded by a mixed crowd dressed in the costumes of that time, animatedly discussing the goings-on and demonstrating various different attitudes toward the major personage. This famous triptych was painted by Master Lucas for the chapel of the city hospital in Leiden and seems to have served as a moral example during sermons rather than an image to be appealed to in prayer. The gospel event is handled here as a genre scene. The figures of heralds on the side panels used to represent the commissioner's arms contribute the element of an attractive theater performance to this altar painting. Both side panels were separated in 1854 from the central panel and sold at auction together with some other Lombard was endowed with restless intellectual activity. He was renowned as a teacher, theorist, and connoisseur of art, who traveled to Italy and kept up friendly relations with humanists. But in his self-portrait, he did not attempt to prettify the natural crudity of his appearance, for it was traditional in Dutch art. The motif of St. Christopher became especially popular in Dutch and German art on the eve of the Reformation. The image of the saint who carried the Christ child over a stream was intended to hold the Christian idea high over the waves of the worldly sea. It signified the ideal of the Christian faith.
It is thought that pearls lose their luster in the absence of direct contact with a living body, which is why pearls were always thought to be a symbol of love. In the jewelry of the 16th century, big pearls were favored, while gold and other precious stones served only as additional elements. Personages standing in the lower part of the picture against the vast landscape in the distance seem to be free and easy participants of just such a feast procession. The picture was painted for the altar of the prophet Daniel in St. Donatian's Church in Bruges. Because of religious wars in the 1560s, the panel was bricked up into the wall of this church in order to save it from iconoclast fanatics but it was forgotten there for some time. It was rediscovered in 1795 when the church was demolished by French troops. One of the great teachers of Western Christianity, the interpreter and translator of the Bible into Latin, St. Jerome, was always considered a patron of scholars. In Northern Europe, his image became especially popular in the 16th century, when humanism actively spread among scholars and educated sections of the clergy. Muscular nudes, treated often in active movement, suggest the interest of this painter in Michelangelo's plastic art. But on the whole, he owed little to Italian artists because all northern artists aimed, as this altarpiece displays, at a deeper emotional expression. In this embroidered picture, which is the first scene in the series, Legend of the Night Swan, we can see the marriage ceremony at the court of the king. A Latin inscription on the canopy informs us that King Orients married Beatrix for love. As a rule, tapestry works were commissioned and executed as a series in order to decorate the inner walls of palaces and castles in place of mural paintings. Being dressed in uniform to distinguish their corporation, these men, all imbued with calm dignity, represent a close unity 
brought together by common interests and duties. There are few group portraits in museums and collections outside the Netherlands because this type of portraiture was destined, as a rule, for public halls, and most such works remained in their original places. <laughs>